Good evening. Go ahead and grab your Bibles and open them up to the Gospel of John this evening, chapter 16. We'll be looking at verses uh, uh, 5 to 15 uh, tonight. And the title of this message is The God Dwelling Within Us. And of course, as I shared this morning, that title should uh, point most of you in this room to that we're talking about the Holy Spirit. That is the God dwelling within us if you are in Christ. And so just based off of some of the feedback or maybe even the lack of feedback uh, from last week's message, it just kind of maybe the, the Spirit just spoke to my heart that we need to, to, to pause a little bit and talk a little bit more about uh, His role in our lives uh, a, a little bit more because I think that, that maybe we talk about, we ask the Spirit to do certain things in our lives and we know He's active, but we don't really understand his function in a totality, if that makes sense. And so hopefully tonight, this passage will help us to understand uh, his working in us a, a little better than it has uh, in, in the past. And so uh, it may be the reason that we, we are so uh, shy about the Holy Spirit or, or, or talking about the Holy Spirit is that, you know, we tend to lean more conservative in our views as far as, as we look at the Bible and as we read the, 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 the Bible and perhaps our views on the Holy Spirit have been uh, distorted or, or, or whatnot or misrepresented by our full gospel uh, brothers and sisters or, or you know along those lines the Pentecostals or whatever the case is that the, the Holy Spirit does a whole lot more than allow people to speak in tongues right the Holy Spirit does a whole lot more than cause people to run up down the aisles or, or pass out and all those type of things, right? We, we know this. I mean, the, in fact, the, the case can be made for speaking in tongues from the New Testament right, as a sign gift. But every time the, the, that we see it in the New Testament that that happened, the, they, didn't, they spoke in known languages. It wasn't gibberish, right? It wasn't gaga, goo goo, and this, that, and the other. It was a, a known language. And, and as far as the, 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 the other stuff, the running around, the barking and passing out, all that kind of stuff, none, none of that is supported by the Scriptures. That's all nonsense. But I believe that sadly, uh, because of you know the other denominations and their misrepresentations of the Holy Spirit, we tend to minimize His ministry in our churches. Right? We don't want to talk about Him as much as we should to our own detriment. You see, we're desperate for the presence of the Holy Spirit to fill this place, this place every time we gather. We're desperate. We need Him to be here in, the, in our midst when we meet. We're desperate for the Holy Spirit to, to, to work in, in, in our churches all over the, the world. We need the, the, the Holy Spirit to work in our homes. We are desperate for the Holy Spirit to work in every single area of our lives. Not just here. Everywhere that we go, we need the Spirit of God to work in our lives. And So I cannot emphasize how important it is that we fully grasp the person and work of the Holy Spirit. And so that's what I hope for us to do tonight you know because he is vital he is absolutely vital uh, to to us to the spiritual health of us as individuals but also to the spiritual health of us as a church as a whole see the church without or a church without the presence of the holy spirit isn't a church a church without the presence of the holy spirit isn't a church just like a, a, a christian without the presence of the holy spirit isn't a christian either right that's what separates a church from, from just a, a gathering of good people, good and moral people, or, or so they would say, it's the presence of God, and it's the same way as believers. And so in our passage tonight, just a little bit of background, you know, when I move from book to book, it's important for us to kind of talk about where we're at. You know, we're not following through verse by verse as we are in the morning. And in uh, John's gospel, uh, what we're looking at is part of what is known as the upper room discourse. It's a, it's a precious section of scriptures because you, if you think about the intimacy that's taking place, that, that Jesus knows that his time has come. And, and he's, this, these are his last moments. These are his last hours that he's spending with the disciples and, he, and he's investing in them and praying with them and trying to encourage them because his time is coming. And so you can see this uh, if you're curious. Uh, chapters 13 to 17 is what makes up this section uh, known as the Upper Room Discourse. And so, as, as I said, Jesus was spending his last hours before uh, they were going to come and arrest him in the garden and then he would be tried uh, with a little kangaroo court and, all, and then taken to the cross. And so uh, what he's making clear for, for them and for us, Jesus was departing, but he wanted his disciples to know uh, that he would be coming back someday. It wasn't, it wasn't 
forever. He wasn't gone forever. We see in John 14, 1 to 3, he says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are, are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And so he is making it clear that he was going to come back, but he was also making it clear that he wanted his disciples to know that he wasn't abandoning them either. Right? He wasn't leaving them alone. We see this uh, just a little further down in, in chapter 14, in verses 16 to 18. And he says, And I will pray the Father, and he will give you a, another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the, wor the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be, that's a key phrase, will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. And so tonight we're going to uh, take a, a look at three functions of the Holy Spirit. And of course, I, I shouldn't have to say this, but I will. There are many, many more. <laughs> There's a lot more than three functions. These are the three that we see in our passage tonight. We'll see that he helps us, he convicts us, and he guides us. That's the three functions that we'll look at tonight. And so go ahead and grab your Bibles if you have them with you and stand as we honor the reading of God's word uh, together. John chapter 16, verses 5 to 15. It says, But now I go away to him who sent me, and none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they do not believe in me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However... When he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you, all things that the Father has are mine. Therefore I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. Father, we ask you tonight to teach us your word. Holy Spirit, teach us your word. Illuminate the scriptures for us. Help us to, to know you better. Help us to understand uh, your work in our lives. Help us to rely on you even more than we do now. We're desperate for you to be active and present in this place. We're, we're, we're desperate for you to be active and present in every area of our lives. So help us to, to, to know you better as we leave here tonight than we did before we came in. We love you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The, the first function of the Holy Spirit that we see in our text is that He helps us. Right? He helps us. In verses 5 to 7, it says, But now I go away to Him who sent me, and none of you ask, Where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. And nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you but if i depart i will send him to you the first thing that that jesus does in, in verses five and six is he, he demonstrates his compassion for the disciples right his compassion that he has for them that even though he had been preparing them at this point he'd been saying over and over again that his time was drawing near and, and he had taught them repeatedly that he'd be going to the cross and he would die on the cross all these things now the reality is is, is actually happening Right now, now it's here. The time has come. It, it, in the past, it was down the road, and we can kind of put it behind us. And you know, I want to think about it now. We'll get, you can't help but think about it now. It's happening. And so the, the disciples were are, are just you know are devastated. The, the, the reality of the moment is crashing in on them. And, and Jesus could tell from the looks on their faces, and I'm sure the tears in their eyes. He said that they saw that that sorrow had filled their hearts. It filled their hearts at the reality that, that Jesus, their Messiah, the, the, the one who they've been following for all these years, is now going to be not be with them anymore. But then he really shocked them when it, with, with his next statement in verse 7. He, he, he told them it was, to the, he says, it's to your advantage that I go away. 
right? What a shocking statement. How, in what universe is it ever going to be an advantage that Jesus leaves, right? He said, I, we don't get that. We don't understand. What, what are you talking about? How could the departure of Jesus be an advantage to the, the, the disciples? What possible scenario could there ever be than, than to have the Son of God with you in the flesh? You see, there's only one scenario that's better. And that's what Jesus is talking about. There's one scenario that's better. It's better to have the Spirit of God in you than to have the Son of God with you. See, that's the difference. That's, that's what he's trying to get them to understand, right? It's better to have the, the Spirit of God in you than to have the Son of God with you, at least for now, right? At least for now. That's we have to kind of keep this uh, in context. So, uh, you know, he says, for, I do not, uh, for if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you, but if I depart, I will send him to you. And so it's important uh, to note that the Holy Spirit is, 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 is uh, not more important than Jesus. That's not what he's saying here. It's not more important than Jesus that Paul uh, would make it clear that Jesus was and is uh, uh, preeminent in all things, right? In Colossians 1.18, we, we see this. Uh, and, and it's just that the, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit is more advantageous because he is, a, he is spirit and not flesh. Right, that the limitation of Jesus and the flesh being fully God and fully man is that he can only be in one place at one time. There's only one Jesus, right? So he, he couldn't be everywhere. He couldn't be in all situations, whereas the, the Holy Spirit is omnipresent, right? That, that, that he, and I keep saying he because it, it, it is a he. He is a he and not a it, right? Even though uh, he is a spirit, he can be everywhere at, at one time. So that's the advantage that we can all experience his presence. Instead of uh, Jesus being, uh, I guess, locked or, 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 or limited to being in one place at one time. So, uh, as ridiculous as it sounds, Jesus needed to depart. <laughs> right? I mean, it's hard to even say that. That only makes sense to those, utter those words that Jesus needed to go. He needed to depart. That because Jesus' departure would mean that our sin debt had been paid in full. That is a, 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 a great reason, a, a valid reason, and a, and a joyful one. Uh, that God's wrath against uh, us because of our sin had been uh, fully satisfied. Well, that's what it would signify. But also, the promised Holy Spirit would come, right, after He departed. He had to depart for that. That's what all these things would come to pass at His departure. The promise was kept on the day of Pentecost as the apostles and likely dozens of other uh, 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 disciples of Jesus uh, uh, were hiding out or hanging out or hiding out, whatever word you want to use, uh, possibly in the same upper room that they're in now, uh, in Jerusalem, whenever the, the Holy Spirit fell, we, we see this in Acts 2, verses 1 to 4. It says, uh, when, the, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, uh, they were all uh, with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Uh, then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And so what's different now is in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come and go on individuals, basically like an anointing. They would be anointing for a, a time period, but then the Holy Spirit would uh, depart from them uh, once that, that uh, period of time had ended. And now, uh, you know, from the day of Pentecost onward, the Holy Spirit, uh, His presence uh, would be permanent. Right, would be permanent because our salvation is permanent. And so uh, it, it began with the apostles and disciples, then Peter preached, and 3,000 more got saved and filled with the Holy Spirit. And now, here we are today. Right, Here we are today, to over 2,000 years later, and we're on the other side of the world. And guess what? People are still getting saved, and people are still being filled with the Holy Spirit. And it continues, and it will continue until uh, Jesus says otherwise. And so, um, how does the Holy Spirit help us, right? That's the question here. You know, how does He help us? That's the, the point that we're looking at here. Uh, it would not be a stretch to say that, that the Holy Spirit helps us in every way possible, right? In every way possible, but, but, but some specific ways. Uh, he comforts us, right? He comforts us. He teaches us. He illuminates the Scriptures for us. Uh, he strengthens us. He in, encourages us. Uh, he reminds us of, of who we are in Christ, and He also advocates for us uh, as well. And that's just the name of a few. And in fact, uh, the next two points that we're going to look at, they're also 
uh, ways that the Spirit helps us as well. And so the Holy Spirit helps us uh, in every way. And so the, the second function of the Holy Spirit that we see in our text is that He convicts us. Verses uh, 8 to 11 says, And when He has come, He will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment uh, of sin because they do not believe in me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. And so when we think about uh, conviction or the word uh, con uh, convict, it simply means to convince, reprove, or correct. That's basically what it, what it means. And so the Holy Spirit convicts uh, the world through the proclamation of God's Word. That's how it happens. That's how uh, we all are, are still experience the conviction of the Holy Spirit whenever the Word uh, goes forth. Uh, that uh, Kenneth Gangle explains the Spirit's work of conviction like this. He says, The Holy Spirit uh, does not float around the cosmos like Casper the Friendly Ghost, spreading general feelings of conviction. The New Testament makes it plain that conviction and awareness of sin come through the hearing of Scripture. Right? Come through the hearing of Scripture. And we know this as well. Paul wrote in Romans 10, 17, So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And so uh, I have two examples I, I want us to, to look at and think about the, this, the concept of conviction, the Spirit's conviction of unbelievers through the preaching of the Word. Both of these are in the book of Acts. Uh, example number one is after uh, Peter's uh, sermon on the day of Pentecost. This is a, what we'd say is a positive response uh, uh, of conviction. In Acts 2, verses 37 and, uh, to, to 39, it says, uh, Now when they heard this, you know, Peter was preaching, uh, and now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises to you and to your children and, and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. All right, that's what we want. That's, that's my hope every time. I step in this pulpit and I preach and I, and I give an invitation. That's what I'm asking God for. I want people to, to, to repent. I want people to come to faith in Jesus Christ. I want the lost to be saved. Uh, but, but that's not always the case. And sometimes uh, there's a negative response or no response at all. But the, the second example we see is a, a very negative response. After, after Stephen, Stephen's sermon, Peter had a good response and Stephen had about as bad a response as you could possibly have. They not only rejected his message, they killed him. Right in Acts uh, seven fifty four and in uh, fifty seven and fifty eight it says when they heard these things again Stephen's uh, preaching the word these things they were cut to the heart so there's the conviction and they gnashed at him with their teeth right I've had a lot of things happen when I preach but I never had anyone gnash at me with their teeth they've gnashed their teeth but not at me but I've seen them gnash their teeth whenever I've preached before uh, then they cried out verse fifty seven they, they cried out with a loud voice uh, and stopped their ears and ran at him with one accord and they cast him out of the city and stoned him and the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And so that's the, the way conviction works. That's how the conviction of the Holy Spirit works whenever the, the, the Word of God uh, goes forth. And so uh, uh, when God's Word is proclaimed, the Holy Spirit convicts. Uh, the, the Holy Spirit also convicts uh, the world of sin, right? Of, of sin. Uh, because it says there in verse 9, because they do not believe in me. Uh, and I really like this quote I found by uh, a man named uh, R. Allen Culpepper. He says, The Spirit makes a depraved world aware of its sin. He reveals our need to believe in the crucified and risen Lord who can remove our guilt and set us right with God. All right, that, that's, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. That, that, that there is no such thing, uh, and we need to always remember this, there's no such thing as little sins in big sins. There, there's no such thing. We don't have uh, felonies and, and misdemeanors. There's just sin. And so, uh, you know, I think that sometimes uh, some churches tend to focus on certain sins or things they believe to be sins uh, and fixate on, no, on those things. You'll have some churches they'll focus on, uh, uh, on beer, on tattoos, on piercings, and political affiliations, right? And they, and they focus on those things. And so those things are the devil. Right? Those are just the worst things possible. But you see, if you read your Bibles, you know, uh, believe it or not, unbelief is the sin that condemns people to hell. 
not tattoos, not piercings, not beer, and not being uh, un, uh, uh, a different political leaning, I guess. I'll just say it that way. I'm not going to assume anyone's any party in this room. And so unbelief is the sin that condemns people to hell. Uh, we love to quote John 3.16. We love that verse. But we need to keep on reading down to verse 18 to really get the fullness of what, what Jesus is talking about here. He says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. And here in verse 18, he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who, who does not believe is condemned already. Why? Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Not because of his political leanings, not because of his piercings or tattoos or whatever else that we want to fill in the blank and say those things are just awful and they're just the, the worst sins possible. People die and go to hell because they have not believed in Jesus. Those other things might just be side effects or things leading up to. And so it's, I think it's important for us to remember that, not fixate on pet sins or things that we think are sin or things that we don't like, you know, or it's not, we don't, we don't want to talk about our sin. We don't talk about our overeating and stuff like that, things that the Bible really talks about, gluttony. We don't talk about things like that. We don't talk about sins that other people do. But see, it's all captured in the same, it puts it in one pile. There's no such thing as little sins or big sins. There's only sin. So the Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin and also the Holy Spirit convicts the world of righteousness. Verse 10 says, Of righteousness is because I go to my Father and you see me no more. You see, the, the world around us, everyone, you don't have to be a Christian, everyone applauds uh, uh, righteousness you know, in people when they, you know, when they do good for others. We all like do-gooders. We all like those feel-good stories where, where people help one another out, random acts of kindness, all those things. And, and But you see, just being a good person, doing good things for others, that's the wrong standard of goodness. All right, that's the wrong standard. The, the fallen world system does not get to decide what is good and what is not good. Sinners don't get to decide what righteousness is. Right? Sinners don't know what righteousness is, to be honest with you. You see, just being a good person is not good enough for God. Right? Let me say it one more time. Being a good person is not good enough for God. Besides, there's no such thing as a good person because everyone sins. Right? That's what the Bible says. There's no, no, none good, no, not one. Right? And so as far as the, the world goes, we'll say, well, that's a good person, that's a good person, that's a bad person, that's a bad person. The, uh, under sin, because of sin, all bad people. None good, not one, not single, one single one. Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And you see, the problem is God requires perfection. He requires sinless perfection from us that sinful men cannot attain for themselves. And only the Holy Spirit can reveal a sinner's need for God's perfect righteousness. That's why we share the gospel. Right? That's what the Great Commission is about, telling others about their need to repent of their sins and place their faith in Jesus Christ to, to be able to have His imputed righteousness given to them. That's why I preach the Word of God and not just my opinions. That's why we must always be pointing people to Jesus. You see, Jesus alone is our standard of righteousness. He alone is our standard of righteousness. Not, not, not this person, not that person, not this church, not that church. Jesus alone is our standard of righteousness. The Holy Spirit convicts the world of righteousness, but the Holy Spirit also convicts the world of judgment. Verse 11, he says, of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. Satan is a defeated foe. Satan is a defeated foe. I, I've read the end of the book, y'all. Y'all read the end of the book and y'all read what it says? He's defeated. You see, when Jesus died on the cross and rose from the grave, the penalty for sin died with him. Uh, for, for those who believe in, in, in Christ, that Satan and his demons are operating on borrowed time right now. They are. They're, they're, they're on the clock. It's ticking away. They're operating on borrowed time. That judgment has already been rendered. And Satan and his demons are on death row as we speak. They just don't realize it, perhaps. That John saw their end in a vision and wrote it down in Revelation 20.10. Revelation 20.10 says, The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. You see, hell wasn't made for, for, for fallen humans. 
hell was made for uh, Satan and his fallen angels. That was the original intent for him, right? And so we all just need to know this. Nobody gets away with sin. Nobody. Nobody gets away with sin. Nobody does. Not Satan, not his demons, not you, and not me. Nobody gets away with sinning. Again, Pastor uh, John MacArthur makes this perfectly clear. He says, The sobering warning to those who embrace the world system is that since its ruler will not escape judgment, neither will they unless they repent. The devil's fate guarantees the judgment of every unrepentant sinner. You see, we, the world needs to know that there is judgment coming. It's not just a scare tactic. Amen? The Holy Spirit convicts the world of judgment. The Holy Spirit convicts of us of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. And the third function of the Holy Spirit that we see in our text tonight is that He guides us. Verses uh, 12 to 15. It says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when He, the Holy Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth, for He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will tell you things to come. He will glorify Me, for He will not take of what is Mine, for He will take of what is Mine and declare it to you. All things the Father has are Mine. Therefore I said, that He will take of mine and declare it to you. So the, the Holy Spirit guides us into all truth. That's what we see there in, in, in verse 13. It says there, However, when He, the, Holy, uh, the Spirit of truth, uh, has come, He will guide you into all truth. So what we need to know about truth is this. All truth is God's truth. All truth is God's truth. If it's true, it's of God. If it's not true, it's not of God. It's just that simple. Right? It's not that complicated. That's, that's the reality of, of, of truth. And so we think about uh, truth. There's two views of truth. There's something called absolute truth and there's something called relative truth. Absolute truth is uh, that something is true for all people in all times, in all places, in all situations. That's what it means to have an absolute truth. It's true for all people, not just a small group. Everyone. It applies to everyone. Uh, uh, for example, Jesus is the only way to be saved. That's an absolute truth. Right? It's not just true for you and me and not for other groups of people. It's for all people. John 14, 6 tells us this. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Right? That's one type of truth. Absolute truth. That's what we believe in. Right? Then there's also relative truth, which means uh, the truth is dependent upon certain variables. In other words, relative truth is changing truth. It's changing truth. Well, that might be true for you, but it's not true for me. Right? You know, that, that might apply to your life. You might believe that to be true, but I, I don't believe that, and therefore it don't, you know, apply to me. You, understand? you ever heard people say things like that? That might be your truth, right? But, but I don't believe that. I don't believe that to be true, and therefore I reject your truth. And so that's what we mean when we're talking about relative truth. You think about an example of that as maybe, you know, Jesus may be right for you, but, but, you know, for me and my family, Hinduism is the right way to go. That, that's our truth. That's an example of, of, of relative truth. And so uh, as, as Christians, we believe the Word of God is full of absolute truth. It's full of it from, from cover to cover, uh, from a table of contents to maps, right? All of it. It's all uh, absolute truth for us. As Christians, we also believe that, that God's truth must not be tampered with. It must not be tampered with, right? I, I, and I, I want to be clear. I'm not talking about different English translations. That's not what I'm talking about here, right? That, and, and to be, to be open about this, uh, some translations are better than others. I'll leave it at that, right? But, but that's not, I'm, ta I'm talking about, I'm talking about, uh, purposely, uh, 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 tampering with it, changing it, removing things, and, and you know, just being malicious is what we're talking about here. And so when we think about uh, different translations, uh, that's a whole other subject. Because we, ha we have to remember that the original manuscripts that we have were translated from uh, Greek and Hebrew, right? Not, not from the King's English, right? That, that's also a translation. So that's what I want to be sure I'm talking about here. That, uh, that John uh, uh, gave a, a warning against this, against, against manipulating or twisting the Scriptures in Revelation 22. Uh, 18 and 19 he says for i testify to everyone who hears 
uh, the words of, of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city and from the things which are written in this books, in this book. Right? It takes it seriously, right? We, we, we know another part, it's not like a, a, a jot or a tittle, same type of things. It's not to be uh, 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 tampered with, that God's word is our truth regardless of what culture, culture adopts or holds on to, no matter what our, our, the majority says in our nation, if it's, it goes against God's word, we follow God. Right? No matter what the, what the vote says, we follow God. We will not follow the world into sin because God's word or, or God's truth is always trustworthy. It's always trustworthy because it's impossible for the spirit of truth to inspire error. Right? We, we know with absolute certainty that the Bible is without error. We do. We know this because the Holy Spirit is the one who inspired it. Right? We know that the Holy Spirit inspired the writers of Scripture to write down God's truth. We see this in 2 Timothy 3.16, another verse that we uh, quote quite often around here. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, and in righteousness. You see, not only did the Holy Spirit inspire the writers, the Holy Spirit also illuminates our understanding. We touched on this some this morning. 1 John 2, uh, 2, 20 and 21. It says, But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. We have this uh, anointing, this uh, illuminating work of the Spirit in our lives. But you see, he can't open our minds to understand what we haven't read. That's the trick. All right, he can't open our minds to understand Scripture that we have not yet read. So since the Holy Spirit is God, he knows all that God knows, and he is the one who is qualified to reveal all of God's truth. That's what uh, we, we, that John is, is wanting to make clear for us here tonight. The Holy Spirit uh, uh, guides us, also guides us to glorify Jesus. All right, he guides us into all truth, but he also guides us to glorify Jesus. In verses uh, 14 and 15, he says, He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that, that he will take of mine and declare it to you. So the Holy Spirit always points people to the person and work of Jesus. Y'all notice that? If you're a student of the Bible and you, and you read the Gospels, Every time you see the Holy Spirit mentioned in scriptures, he's always pointing to Jesus. He's never, he's never claiming any credit for himself or ever speaking about himself. He's always pointing to the person and work of Jesus. He, he never takes credit for anything. And just as Jesus always pointed to the Father, the Spirit always points to Jesus. We see an example of this, uh, of, of Jesus uh, submitting himself to the Father in John uh, 5.30. He says, uh, I can do I can of myself do nothing as I hear I judge and my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the father who sent me. So uh, we think about glorifying God and, and giving glory, glory to Jesus and all these things. Guess what we're going to be doing for all of eternity in heaven? <laughs> you know, that's what kind of those, those it just kind of boggles my mind. That we have so many people that, that, that say they love Jesus and they follow Jesus and they're, and they're blood-born children of God and all that stuff, but yet they will not worship Jesus. They, they do not have a desire to gather with the church and worship Jesus. And yet that's the very thing that we will be spending the majority of our time in heaven and all of eternity. We'll be glorifying Jesus in everything that we do. Right? So that's why I think the, the, the Holy Spirit is getting us used to doing that right now, right? That, that He is uh, guiding us to glorify Jesus. And it's not just in this room, on this day, it's 24-7, everything that we do, everything that we say, everything that we do should be to glorify Jesus. That, that's what the Spirit is, is guiding us to do. You know, everything that we think, everything that we do, everything that we say should be to glorify Jesus. And when I say everything, I mean everything. If it can't bring glory to Jesus, don't do it. <laughs> that's, a, that's another rule of thumb. If it's not going to bring honor and glory to Him, it's probably something that we don't need to be participating in. The Holy Spirit guides us into 
all truth and to glorify Jesus Christ. So closing tonight, you see if you've repented of your sins and you placed your faith exclusively in the person and work of Jesus Christ, you have the Spirit of God dwelling within you right now. You say, well, I don't, I don't feel like I have the Spirit of God dwelling in me right now. I don't, I don't, I don't feel like there's a, this other person within me. But it's true. In Paul's first letter to the Corinthian churches, he called believers the temple of the Holy Spirit. Right? That's who you are. That's who we are. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit if you've placed your faith in Christ. 1 Corinthians 6.19 he says this, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? So let me just be clear about this, because I think there's some confusion. You are not possessed by the Holy Spirit. You are not possessed by the Holy Spirit. You are the possession of the Holy Spirit. That's a, that's a huge difference. Right, we're not possessed by the Holy Spirit. We're or, or the possession of the Holy Spirit. You are owned, but not controlled. Right, we still have our free will. Now we should be growing more and more obedient to His leadership. And and just be honest with you, I, I want Him to control me, and you should want Him to control you as well. But yet we still have this little thing called a, a, a free will at, at this point. And so uh, the Holy Spirit is also fully God. Uh, he is co-equal with the Father uh, and with the Son. Uh, and so the Holy Spirit is a, a He, as I've already said, not an it, not some impersonal force. We need to know these things. And so let me just ask you, as we finish up tonight, are you making the most of His presence in your life? Are you making the most of His presence in your life right now? You see, because the Bible tells us that He is in you. right? He is in you. He helps you right? in every way possible. He is in you to convict you of sin and righteousness and judgment. He's in you to guide you into all truth and to glorify Jesus Christ. You see, what a gift it is to have God Himself dwelling inside of us if we placed our faith in Him. So my final question tonight, and it's an important one, do you have God dwelling inside of you? Do you have God dwelling inside of you? You see, that's a kind of a, a trick question because what I'm really asking you is, are you saved? Because only saved people have the, the, the God dwelling inside of them. And so if you're not saved, I would invite you to ask God to forgive you of your sins tonight. I'd ask you to place your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Just a, just a simple but sincere prayer is what it takes. It's, it doesn't matter the order of your words, if you say the exact thing. We're not casting a spell. That's not what's happening. We're asking the, 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 the Lord of glory to, to, to forgive you of your sins and to save you and to give you everlasting life. That's what we're doing. And so if you feel led to do that tonight, uh, I invite you to do that of our time of invitation. And uh, as we close, just come let me know. Or if you need help, you say, Brother Mike, I, I want to be saved, but I'm, I'm kind of confused on what I'm supposed to do. Come down front, and I'd love to uh, walk you through that. We just want to know that you've chosen to follow Jesus so we can get you plugged in to a discipleship relationship and get you baptized. All right? Welcome you into the family the right way. All right? Let's pray and we'll have a time of response. Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us. Uh, it's been a, a true blessing from uh, morning prayer to, uh, to the Sunday school hour to the, the morning worship and then the discipleship hour. And then tonight, it's been a, a true joy to be able to uh, spend this time with uh, Forever Family, uh, to, to be in the presence of of the Holy Spirit and to, to, to learn more about your word and, and to be able to apply these truths to our lives to, to help us to become more and more like Jesus. God, thank you for that. We, we don't take it for granted or, or I pray we never take it for granted because in other places in the world, this can't happen. This isn't allowed to happen. So Father, we, we thank you for the uh, being born uh, where we have been born. And so Lord, help us to, to not take that lightly either. But our mission does not change, that we still have a, a great commission. We still have a, a job to do. You've called us to make disciples of all nations. So, Father, we ask that you would, uh, again, uh, help us uh, to see the urgency and the lostness all around us and help us to be uh, ambassadors for, for Christ and help us to, to, to be the hands and feet of Jesus in our community. And Father, for those here tonight that, that 
uh, already uh, that have, have come under conviction tonight of the Holy Spirit and tonight's the night to be saved. And tonight's the night to, to, to finally get things right between uh, you and them. And so Father, I pray that you would give them the courage to do just that, uh, to turn from their sins and, and, and uh, turn to Jesus. Father, thank you again for all that you've done this day. We thank you for all that you're going to do here at Invitation Time. We also thank you uh, for all that you're going to do in this upcoming week. We love you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.